right, here we are. Hello everyone, welcome to uh, our astronomy trivia night. I'm your host, Ilana McDonald, and uh, today I'll be uh, <laughs> hosting some fun trivia for you. Um, so uh, for those of you just joining in, um, in order to participate in the quiz, just go to cookies.it, uh, or if you have the cookie app already, go ahead and use that. Um, and put in this game pin, so it's 956-3491. You can see it at the top of your screen. And uh, as soon as you get in there, uh, we just ask that you put your actual email address if you want to uh, win a prize. Uh, because otherwise we won't be able to get in touch with you. But that being said, we will not use your email address for anything other than just getting in touch with you uh, as long as you uh, have won a prize. So there's lots of people joining in. It's fantastic to see you all. Uh, hello to everyone in the chat. It's great to see how many people are from all over the place. Um, and so I'll just give us a few moments to get started and to get us uh, all signed in. So once again, go to cookie.it and put in the game pin that you see at the top of your screen. Got a lot of people coming in. That's excellent. So great to see you all. I'm really excited to do some trivia with you all tonight. We've got some fun prizes that I'll be announcing in just a few moments. Um, and uh, yeah, once we get started, we'll have a, uh, a few fun questions. For you today. And uh, just keep in mind that there might be a little bit of lag between what I'm saying and uh, what appears on the stream. And so if you're seeing a little bit of lag, um, then just refresh the stream, refresh the, the YouTube page, and you should uh, be able to catch up. All right. So I'll give it another. 30 seconds or so. Once again, really great to see you all here. For those just joining, uh, make sure you go to cookies.it, enter the game pin that you see at the top of the screen. You can also copy and paste it from the chat. Uh, we'll put it in there. And, uh, and we'll get ready to start in just a moment. All right, I think this is probably a good time to get started. So thank you all for attending our October, I believe it's already October, our October Astronomy Trivia Night, hosted by the Dunlap Institute at the University of Toronto. Um, before we get started, I just want to do a brief land acknowledgement. Um, so we wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. Uh, for thousands of years, it's been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And this is the first uh, trivia night that I've done from University of Toronto campus, so that makes me very excited as well. Um, all right, so we're about to get started. Uh, a lot of you have already signed in, which is amazing. Um, and uh, just to go over some things, if you're just signing in, uh, make sure to put your real email address. Otherwise, we can't contact you if you're one of the top five winners. Um, but we'll have the, uh, the PIN number in the chat, and uh, it will be at the bottom of the screen uh, for when we get, want to get started, or, you know, for if you joined late. Okay, so um, let's get started. 
So, uh, as I said, this is hosted by <laughs> the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics, and the topic of our quiz tonight will be all about stars. So, let's start with a few of the rules. So, of course, anybody can play. Um, however, if you uh, win a prize, we can only send prizes to Canadian addresses outside of Quebec. So, sorry, Quebec. Sorry if you live outside of uh, of Canada, we can't send you prizes, but you're more than welcome to uh, play along and have a lot of fun with us. Uh, another thing is that people with graduate degrees in astronomy or some equivalent expertise are not eligible for, to win prizes. So you, we just want to make sure that it's fair for everyone. It's meant for a more general audience, but if you have a graduate degree in astronomy, you have a bit of an unfair advantage. Um, we welcome kids to play, but if you're under 18, make sure that you have your parents' permission to play. And keeping in mind that there might be kids around, uh, please keep the chat respectful and family friendly. And as I already said, if you win, want to win a prize, you have to use your real email address on Kahoot. And we promise, pinky swear, that we won't use it for any reason except for to contact the winner. Now, our prizes tonight are quite fabulous. We have uh, a large selection to go with. So uh, we actually have five different prize packs that we're giving out. And how we're doing it this time, which is a little bit different than previous trivia nights, is that if you're the first place winner, you get your first choice of prizes. If you're the second place winner, you get your second choice of prizes. And if you're the third place winner, then you get your third choice of prizes. And then we'll have uh, one random draw from everybody who participated, and they'll get a fourth uh, choice of prizes. Because we know sometimes if you win first place, sometimes you want that second place prize. So this way, you, you have a choice of, of many different prizes to go from. So uh, our, one of our prize sets is our limited edition Chime Lego set, which is really, really cool. Another one is an ever-popular 3D printed moon globe, which I know a lot of people really, really love. And we have a whole bunch of Dunlap Institute swag, some of which is really, really, really neat. Um, so those are our prizes for tonight. So, you know, get ready to play and uh, try to win some of these prizes. Um, keep in mind that as the questions are coming up, uh, the faster you answer, the uh, more points you get. So try to answer these questions as quickly as possible. All right, here is our first question. So which nebula is the closest stellar nursery? We've got a little bit of lag here with the image showing up, but uh, this is an image of this object, this nebula, and it is the closest stellar nur nursery. What is its name? Is it the Orion Nebula, the Eagle Nebula, the Dumbbell Nebula, or the Andromeda Nebula? So which of these is it? So I'll just give you a few moments to answer. Got about three seconds left to get those answers in. And most people guessed it correctly. It is, in fact, the Orion Nebula, which is in the constellation Orion, appropriately named. It's the closest stellar nursery to us, at about 1,300 light years away. And it's a place where stars are going. So stars are born in these big, beautiful clouds of gas uh, that you can see right here. Um, and uh, this nebula has hundreds and hundreds of stars that are in various stages of formation. Moving on to the next question, we will first look at our scoreboard. So it looks like Cheerful Lars is in the lead for now. We'll see what happens as the games continue. So moving on to our next question. In what 2014 video game is there a penal colony on an asteroid in the stellar nursery, that is a place where stars are born, known as the Pillars of Creation? So is it Elite Dangerous? Is it Mass Effect 3? Is it Solaris? Or is it Star Trek Online? So which of these uh, places uh, is there a penal colony where <laughs> on an asteroid in, in the stellar nursery. Got about five seconds left. Get those answers in. And 
The answer is, in fact, this game called Elite Dangerous, which is a really, really fun game. And in fact, the Pillars of Creation are a star-forming region uh, in a place called the Eagle Nebula. And Elite Dangerous lets you travel around the entire galaxy, and it has a lot of actual locations that are in our own galaxy, which is pretty cool. All right, looking at our scoreboard, we now have Amusing Fox, who's taken the lead. Uh, with Power Alpaca in a close second. So let's see if the rest of you can catch up. Our next question is a true or false question. So most stars in the galaxy are in binary systems. That is, two stars that are orbiting around each other. Is this true or false? So are most stars in the galaxy in a binary system where two stars are orbiting around? So it looks like it was split 50-50, and the answer is actually false. As it turns out, we think that most of our uh, stars in our galaxy are these very, very tiny red dwarf galaxy stars, uh, stars that are all by themselves. Um, so only about a third of the stars in our galaxy are two stars orbiting around each other. Um, and this was a discovery that was made uh, in about 2006. Until then, we thought that most of the stars in the galaxy were actually in these binary systems. Let's look again at our scoreboard. Cheerful Lark is in the lead now. Excellent job. But it looks like there's many people who are catching up, so excellent job to all of you. Let's continue to our next question. What process powers stars during most of their lives? So is it nuclear fission, chemical burning, electromagnetic forces, or is it hydrogen fusion? So which one of these processes powers stars during most of their lives? Nuclear fission, chemical burning, electromagnetic forces, or hydrogen fusion? And most of you got the correct answer. It is, in fact, hydrogen fusion. So when stars form and uh, they're in these big clouds of gas where the gravity is making them contract it on themselves, at some point, it gets hot enough and dense enough that hydrogen fusion, that is, two hydrogen atoms fusing together to create heavier elements, um, that's when it can begin. So uh, good job to uh, those of you who got the right answer. And looking once again at our scoreboard, Shield for Lark has maintained the lead. Excellent job. Moving to our next question, how many times more massive would Jupiter have to become to be a star? So Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. It's a gas giant. And how many more times, uh, how many more mass times more massive would it have to be to become a star? So five times more massive, 20 times more massive, 80 times more massive, or 200 times more massive? We've got about three seconds left. Two, one. And most of you got the correct answer. Excellent. Uh, Jupiter, the largest planet in our solar system, would have to be 80 times larger to be a star. Jupiter is made of essentially the same stuff that stars are, that is mostly hydrogen. Um, however, uh, it would have to be much, much, much larger uh, to be a star. Looking once again at our scoreboard, oh my gosh, it looks like Amusing Urchin has gotten the lead. And uh, Excited Possum is in a very close second. So uh, get those answers in quickly and see if you can catch up. All right. Approximately how long does it take a particle of light, also known as a photon, created in the sun's core to reach its surface? So this process of hydrogen fusion creates what we call photons, or particles of light, and that is what is coming out of the sun, what is, what is making the sun shine, essentially. Um, so how long does it take one of those light particles to get to the surface, though? Is it less than a second, eight minutes, one year, or hundreds of thousands of years? So how long does it take a particle of light to get to the sun's surface from the core? And it looks like it was split in uh, half between eight minutes and hundreds of thousands of years. But the correct answer is, in fact, hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so 
even though light travels very, very quickly, and it would take just an instant for it to travel that distance, as light is produced in the core of the sun, it actually bounces around because it's a very dense uh, plasma that is an ionized gas that the sun is made of. And so that particle of light can take hundreds of thousands of years to get from the core all the way out to the surface. So looking again at our scoreboard, it is shuffled up once again with excited possum now in the lead with and cheerful lark in second place. Our next question is a multi-select question, which means that there's more than one answer you can choose. And the question is, what kind of information about a star can we get purely from the color of its light? Can we know its age, its composition, its temperature, or its mass? And it can be more than one of those things. So what features of a star can you get purely from the color of its light, also known as its spectrum? Time's up on that question. And many of you got the correct answers, it seems. You can tell only its composition and its temperature from uh, the color of its light, which we also call its spectrum. All right, looking once again at our scoreboard, it's shuffled again. We've got a musing urchin back in the lead. Moving on to our next question. Here's another true or false question. So since we can tell the temperature of a star from its color, our uh, hotter stars are red and cooler stars are blue. Is that a true or false statement? Hotter stars are red and cooler stars are blue. Is that true or false? And as you answer that question, I'd like to note that the, the image you see here is actually a double star system where one star is blue and one star is a little bit sort of orangey red. So which of those would be cooler and which of those would be hotter? And it looks like most of you got the correct answer. That's excellent. Hotter stars are actually blue and cooler stars are red. So the redder a star is, the cooler its surface is, and the bluer it is, the hotter its surface is. Once again, looking at our scoreboard, things are more or less the same with the Musing Urchin still in the lead. Let's move on to our next question, which is, who came up with our current system of stellar classification? We like to classify stars by their temperature and color, um, and we use these little, uh, this little acronym called uh, OBAFGMKM uh, to classify stars, and use the acronym or the uh, mnemonic device OB a fine gal or die kiss me. Um, but who came up with this system of classification? Is it Annie Jones Cannon, Edward Pickering, William Ina Fleming, or Njar Hertzberg? And it was, in fact, Annie Jones Cannon. So not a lot of you got that question. Annie Jones Cannon was uh, an astronomer, a woman astronomer, who came up with our entire uh, classification system for stars. And she also came up with that, uh, that little mnemonic device, I believe. All right, looking once again at our scoreboard, nothing has changed, but Amusing Urchin is still in the lead. Good job to you. Our next question is, what do we call the primary pattern on the Hertzsprung ruffle diagram where stars spend most of their lives? So this is something called the Hertzsprung ruffle diagram. And this main feature, this primary pattern here, is just this line across that goes diagonally across this graph. Is it called the horizontal branch? the instability strip, the main sequence, or the Hayashi track? So this is a bit of a, maybe a bit more specialized question, but what do we call this? And this is the place where stars spend most of their lives uh, when they're using hydrogen in their cores. And most of you got it, it's in fact called the main sequence. So yes, uh, most of you got that uh, on this Hertzsprung Russell, Russell diagram, which essentially just shows um, temperature on this axis versus brightness on the other axis. And it just shows that the brighter that a star is, usually the hotter it is while it's still in that um, hydrogen burning phase of its life. 
Moving on to the uh, forward once again, Shield for Lark has retaken the lead, so good job to you. Our next question, what is the brightest star in the night sky? So we look at lots of stars in the night sky. Uh, which one of those appears the brightest? Is it Polaris, also known as the North Star? Is it Betelgeuse? Is it Alpha Centauri? Or is it Sirius? Which one of these is the brightest star in the night sky? Remember to get those answers in quickly. Uh, the faster you go, the more points you get. And your time is up. Let's see how you did. Ah, there's a split between Sirius and Polaris, or the North Star. It is actually a common misconception that the North Star is the brightest star in the, in the night sky. And although it is an easy star to spot with your naked eye, it's far from being the brightest one we can see. The brightest star is actually Sirius, which is the brightest star in the constellation uh, Canis Major, which we can usually see in the winter time in the northern hemisphere. And um, this star is about 10 light years away. It's uh, just a bit bigger than the sun. And uh, it's a very, very bright star in the night sky. You can see it very, very easily, even in a light polluted place such as Toronto. Looking once again at our scoreboard, we've got Cheerful Lark still in the lead with Power Alpaca catching up. Let's go on to our next question. So how far is the farthest star we can see with the naked eye? So is it 100 light years away? Is it about 3,000 light years away? Is it about 60,000 light years away? Or is it about 2.5 million light years away? So how far is the farthest single star that we can see with the naked eye? So most of you got the correct answer. It's about 3,000 light years away, which in terms of the size of our galaxy, isn't all that far because our galaxy is, is about 100,000 light years wide. So we can only see stars in our own galaxy out to about 3,000 light years. And this is a star in the constellation uh, Cassiopeia, which is visible all year round. Looking once again at our scoreboard, we've got Cheerful Lark in the lead. Let's see what the next question is. So, which red dwarf star is a way station for interstellar travelers in Douglas Adams, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? So this is uh, one of my favorite books of all time, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And uh, there is a way station around a little red dwarf star. Um, uh, is it Proxima Centauri? Is it Lakai 8760? Is it Bernard's star or is it Captain's star? So which of these stars hosts a way station for interstellar travelers in the book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? And it is, in fact, a star called Bernard's star, which is a very interesting star in that it moves fairly quickly across the sky. Uh, a lot of you entered uh, Proxima Centauri, and this is actually the closest star to us. It's only about four light years away, uh, but it is not <laughs> the star around which uh, this uh, way station for interstellar travelers was. All right. Shield for Lark is still in the lead with Power of Alpaca in, this, in second place. Let's see how we do with the next few questions. So our next question is, uh, large stars have shorter lives than small stars. Is this True or false? That large stars have shorter lives than small stars. So is that a true or false statement? That large stars have shorter lives than small stars. Got about four seconds left. Three, two, one. Put those answers in. And it is, in fact, true. So the bigger a star is, the hotter it burns, and therefore the shorter it lives. Um, 
there are some very, very large stars that can only live a few million years, whereas small stars can live billions and billions and billions of years. Um, so, for example, our sun, which is sort of a medium-sized, smallish star, um, will probably have a total lifespan of about 10 billion years. All right. Getting close to the end of our questions, let's see what the score is. Cheerful lark. Uh, you're still in the lead, so good job to you. Looking at our next question, how far do we expect the sun to expand when it reaches the end of its life? So as you may or may not know, when the sun reaches the end of its life, it's going to start to expand outwards into what we call its red giant phase. But will it, it expand to twice its current size, so between the orbits of Venus and Mercury, to about the orbit of the Earth, or past the orbit of Jupiter? So how far will the sun expand when it reaches the end of its life? And most of you got the correct answer once again. Excellent job. It will be to about the orbit of the Earth. So at some point when the sun runs out of hydrogen fuel in its core, it will enter the red giant phase of its life and it will expand all the way out to the orbit of the Earth, at which point the Earth will probably be burnt to a crisp and life as we know it will end. Uh, which is very depressing to think about, but it probably won't happen for another five billion years. So nothing for us to worry about immediately. All right, let's see our scoreboard once again. And Chilf the Lark, you're still in the lead. Amazing job. So our next question is, it's another pop culture one. In the pilot episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, the crew meets the entity Q at Farpoint Station. Near which supergiant star is Farpoint Station? So in the very first episode of Star Trek The Next Generation, they meet the entity Q pictured here in a very ridiculous hat at a place called Farpoint Station. And near which supergiant is that station? Is it Rigel, Deneb, Bellatrix, or Delta Cephei? And Many of you got the answer correct. It is, in fact, the star Deneb, which is the brightest star in the constellation Cygnus, also known as the Swan. So that, that's where Farpoint Station is. Okay, looking once again at our uh, scoreboard, Chilpa Lark is still in the lead. The amusing clock has moved into second place. And uh, excellent job to Soaring Badger, who uh, has gotten three correct answers in a row. So good job to you. All right, our next question is, which image best represents approximately what this sun will look like after it dies? So will it look like the first image, the second image, the third image, or the fourth image? What will the sun look like approximately after it has died? That is, it's no longer uh, supporting any sort of hydrogen fusion in its core and uh, totally burnt out and uh, nothing is happening anymore. So what will the sun look like after it dies? So the answer, uh, and which most of you got, is the second one here uh, in the blue box. And so, yes, this is a picture of uh, Messier 57, which we also know as the Ring Nebula. And uh, this is approximately what the sun will look like uh, after it has been dead for maybe a few thousand years. Um, and so it will basically be this just gently uh, expanding cloud of gas uh, that is expanding outwards into space. Um, and we think that the star that used to be uh, or that the ring nebula came from was about the same size as the sun. Uh, these other nebula you see here, the red box is a remnant of a supernova explosion, as is the green box. And the, uh, the yellow box is actually a place that stars are born, so not, not a dead star, a stellar remnant. All right, let's see our scoreboard once again. And it has switched up with amusing clocks having moved straight up to the lead. Excellent job. 
We've only got a few questions left, so get those answers in quickly. What is left over when a very, very massive star dies? So some, a star that's at least 20 times the mass of the sun. Do you get nothing because the star annihilates completely? Do you get a white dwarf? Do you get a neutron star? Or do you get a black hole? So what one of these things is left over when a very massive star dies? Do you get nothing, a white dwarf, a neutron star, or a black hole? And the correct answer, which most of you got, excellent job, is a black hole. So when a star is at least eight times as massive as the sun, it will explode in something called a supernova explosion, where it becomes just as bright as an entire galaxy. And, um, you know, it stays that bright for, you know, about a month, and then the core of it becomes either a neutron star or a black hole, a neutron star being the densest object you can get before gravity takes over completely and you get a black hole, which is the densest object known to us in the universe. So very, very massive stars become black holes. Looking once more at our scoreboard, We've got Amusing Fox in the lead. Great job. We've got about uh, one more, two more questions. Uh, so get those answers in and see if you can catch up. So what element of these is not created in the cores of stars? Uh, is it helium, iron, oxygen, or hydrogen? So which one of these elements is not created in the cores of stars? Helium, iron, oxygen, or hydrogen? Ah, looks like I got you with this one. The answer was, in fact, hydrogen. Hydrogen is not created in stars. It was, in fact, present right at the very beginning of the universe. It's the simplest element, and hydrogen is mostly what stars are made of, um, but uh, it's not created in stars. Hydrogen, the lightest element, is fused into all of the heavier elements up to iron. So helium, oxygen, and iron are all created in the cores of stars. All right, moving on to our next question. We've got Power Alpaca, who's made it to the lead. Excellent job. I have no idea who's going to win this thing. It's so close between everybody. Here's our final question. Which American musician, whose real name is Richard Melville, says we are all made of stars? So this image is going to slowly appear uh, over the course of the question. So was it Moby, Prince, Bono, or Sting? Which of these musicians uh, said or had a song called We Are All Made of Stars? Was it Moby, Prince, Bono, or Sting? And the answer is Moby. Excellent. So this is a song that came out in 2002, I believe, uh, where Moby sang to us that we are all made of stars. Um, you know, people will come together, people will go apart, but we're all made of stars. Uh, very good song. I like it a lot. Um, and he stresses an astronaut in the music video. And it is true. All of the elements that are in our bodies, except with the exception of hydrogen, of course, were in fact created in stars. Um, you know, the oxygen in your blood, uh, the uh, iron in your cells, in your blood cells, uh, you know, the gold in your wedding band, all of that stuff was made in stars. Um, so we have to be very thankful to those dead stars for all the elements that are in our body. So now we can look at our scoreboard, uh, our final podium to see our winners. In third place, we have Soaring Badger. In second place, we have Amusing Fox. And our first place winner da -da -da, is Power Alpaca. So great job to you. Uh, congratulations to all our winners and all the people who played. Um, if you put your email into Kahoot, then and if you're one of the top three people, you will have uh, your choice of prizes 
and we will do one random draw out of everybody who participated uh, so that you can also have a choice of prizes too. Um, so uh, congratulations to everyone. I hope you had a lot of fun playing tonight with me. And uh, join us for the next trivia night. If you want to learn about what's coming up, you know, you can uh, subscribe, like, uh, follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, follow us on YouTube, follow us everywhere. Um, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next time. Good night, everyone. <laughs>